<coughs> the title of the panel is uh, Cracks in the Ice, Justice and the State over the Long Durée. We have uh, three presenters. We're going to start with Johannes Ferdinand on um, dystopian utopianism. Okay. So, uh, welcome everybody. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm, do I have to use this? It's not working. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, happy uh, yes, to be here. So the, so the video can pick you up. Oh, okay. So get that as close as you can. Yeah. So? No? Maybe they can turn me off. All right. Uh, or turn, turn off the volume. You're fine. I'll pick it up. We'll All right. You okay, great. So, um, yeah, I'm happy to be here, um, even though I'm a literary scholar, so I feel like a bit of an outsider. Um, nevertheless, I hope that what I have to offer is um, useful to the overall discussion. Uh, what I want to do today is I want to apply the theory of the capitalist scene and capitalism in the web of life to Margaret Atwood's uh, 2003 novel, Oryx and Crake. Is anybody familiar with Oryx and Crake? One person. All right. So, it um, doesn't matter. I'll give a brief uh, introduction in just a second. What is fascinating about Oryx and Craig is um, that it makes graspable, even for non-social science educated readers, the connections of exploitation of labor in industrial societies and the appropriation of cheap nature, both in Western societies and on the colonial periphery. The novel does this by extrapolating current societal trends that will lead to catastrophe if left unchecked. And thus, it serves as a warning call for readers in the early 21st century. So it was written uh, 16 years ago when it wasn't as obvious as it is now. Before I get into it, um, let me give you a brief overview of the structure of my talk. So um, firstly, I will outline the plot of the novel for those unfamiliar with it. Secondly, um, I will talk about exploitation and shaped nature and how they're represented in Oryx and Craig. And lastly, um, I will talk about the novel's capitalist realism between utopia and dystopia, so the way in which um, it is, uh, there is a, a utopian dystopianism or dystopian utopianism, however you want to turn it. The novel um, presents a post-apocalyptic future that clearly shows signs of catastrophic climate change. The only human survivor is the narrator, Jimmy, who calls himself Snowman. And uh, the novel has two main strands. So there's a narrative present which uh, depicts a world in which humanity and most non-genetically engineered animals have been wiped out. The Earth has heated up and, the popul and is populated now by a strange human-like species called the Krakers, as well as genetically engineered animals like uh, the Pigoons. The other larger strand consists of snowmen remembering humanity's last days in the dystopian but pre-apocalyptic future. This world is run by corporations and their private police forces and sharply divided along class lines between skilled laborers living in gated communities and a surplus population living in slums in the US or on a neo-colonial frontier, uh, sorry, periphery. Growing up, uh, Jimmy befriends Craig, who becomes a genetic engineer while Jimmy struggles as an advertiser. He studied English and can't find any job other than in advertising. <laughs> when Craig hires him, um, Jimmy meets Oryx, in whom he believes to recognize a former child pornography actress he's been obsessed with since growing up. Craig is also the engineer of both the virus that will kill off humanity and the breed of genetically improved humanoids, the Krakers, that inhabit uh, the novel's present. Let me now turn to how the novel depicts the various aspects of capitalism in the web of life and its dual process of exploitation and appropriation. So the novel works by contrasting the society in which Jimmy grows up, a corporate world of technocratic elites valuable to capital, with the plebe lands, slums, fill, slums filled with what Marx has called the surplus population, those parts of society that are not needed for the valorization of capital, on the one hand, and Oryx's childhood in a neo-colonial periphery on the other. I want to exemplify how the novel does this um, by focusing on two scenes. 
one in which Jimmy visits his father at work, and one in which Oryx relates how she was sold into slavery as a child. Together, these explore the three dimensions of the nexus of the exploitation of paid work and the appropriation of cheap nature and free work. Firstly, there's the incorporation of workers into the reproduction cycle of capital, exemplified primarily uh, through Jimmy's transformation from a liberal, liberal art idealist to a cynical marketer, and the expulsion of those who are not necessary to the self-valorization of capital. Secondly, there's the appropriation of cheap uh, nature in um, the future US society, indirectly depicted through the effects of uh, global war or climate change, and uh, directly through the genetic alteration of animals into pigoons, um, these little creatures here, who are grown to host uh, for, for um, human host organs, or chicken knobs, uh, who are essentially giant brainless mountains of meat produced for the fast food industry. The third dimension is the appropriation of a female colonial other explored through Oryx's life story. And together these passages illustrate uh, one of Jason Moore's central arguments, namely that, um, quote, capitalism thrives when islands of commodity production and exchange can appropriate oceans of potentially cheap nature outside the circuits of capital but essential to its operation. And the accumulation of abstract social labor is possible only to the degree that unpaid work, human and extra human, can be appropriated by forces and relations that are not themselves economic. The first passage I want to discuss uh, uses the naive perspective of the young Jimmy visiting his father at Organ Inc.'s farm, the corporation that makes the genetically manipulated pigoons, to expose the cruel rationality of capital as expressed by the ideologically interpolated adults. Throughout this passage, Jimmy, who is not yet fully um, cut off from identifying as part of the web of life, empathizes with the pigoons and recognizes their status as fellow creatures. In contrast, the adults express the logic of capital according to which the pigoons have to be raised in the most cost-efficient uh, cost way to maximize profits. Obviously, present-day factory farming serves as a model for the depiction of how the fictional pigoons are raised. They're incarcerated in cages, too small for them to turn around, they're living in their feces, are subjected to permanent optimization to make them grow into commodities even faster, and so forth. As in present-day society, the objectification of these creatures is best not understood as individual ethical failing, but as the logic of capital expressed through us, capitalist subjects, as its agent. An argument Stephen McMullen unfolds in his essay is capitalism to blame animal lives in the marketplace. Although this, this does not relieve us of ethical complicity, it shifts the frame from the reproduction of injustice from an individualist to a systemic logic and therefore also gives us um, tools to work against this. Effective as it may be in unmasking the capitalist common sense with a naive and comparatively uninterpolated child perspective, the chapter is even more interesting for combining a vision of future factory farming with a second aspect, namely the exclusion of an unskilled surplus population. Inadvertently or not, the chapter exposes a similar process of reification happening with regard to the animals as cheap nature and the, viol the violent expulsion of those deemed unnecessary to capitalist production, who are only useful as gray markets, boogeymen of a reserve army, or an amusement ground for the corporate elite. The violence of keeping humans in the plebe lands is based on an epistemological split voiced by Jimmy's father who distinguishes between, quote, our people, likening them to, quote, kings and dukes living in castles, and, quote, the other side, who have to be kept out, um, and that includes rival corporations as well as the plebes living in the slums. This split is different, of course, to the master divide of human nature, but it functions analogously in its divisive and dehumanizing logic. The second chapter I want to um, discuss is even more interesting, for it depicts the systemic nature of global social injustice. Here, 
The grown-up Jimmy forces Oryx, the former child slave, to tell him her childhood story, but interpret it, interprets it according to his Western perspective. When she tells of a cough that will eventually kill her father and the village's explanation of it as, quote, bad water, bad faith, bad spirits, Jimmy suspects that her father has, uh, must have actually brought on the sickness on himself. Quote, of course they all probably smoked like maniacs when they could get uh, the cigarettes smoking dulled the edge. But not only the affirmation of his uh, superior white male interpretation with a paternalizing note of understanding is arrogant, Jimmy reattributes the likely systemic origins of the sickness, the uneven access to medical treatment, to uh, clean drinking water and other basic uh, means of sustenance, as well as the effects of pollution that disproportionately affect non-white populations of a lower socioeconomic standing. Following the go-to model of Western and particularly American individualism, Jimmy interprets the sickness as the result of bad life choices. This belief in the power of individual choice runs through Jimmy's interpretation of Oryx's childhood, standing in opposition to her much more differentiated understanding of the material constraints of poverty. The lack of alternatives that drives the villagers to sell their children into slavery disappears in Jimmy's belief in the freedom of choice, whereas Oryx exhibits an attitude of detached resignation to fate that highlights the capitalist logic of commodification and profit. Whereas Jimmy resorts to childish name calling, Oryx, um, quote, took this double sale, so the sale of both herself and her brother, as evidence that her mother had loved her. She had no images of this love. She could offer no anecdotes. It was a belief rather than a memory." End of quote. This is not to suggest, of course, that the novel approves uh, of the selling of children into slavery. But rather, it refuses Jimmy's flat moralizing and his moralism of pri uh, privilege. In its stead, it points to the systemic violence of a globally uneven class society that reduces people to their worth as producers of value and ties this to the destructive power of capitalist industrialization that has disrupted traditional agrarian pre-capitalist sources of sustenance through environmental catastrophe. This passage makes an important argument about the limits of freedom, differentiating the freedom to and the freedom from. The freedom to sell your children is no real freedom, of course, but a variation of capitalism's pseudo-freedom to sell your labor power in the marketplace that comes with the simultaneous compulsion to do so because you are also freed from the means of production, as Marx puts it in Capital. This freedom, in uh, quotation marks, however, is exacerbated by a colonial imbalance of power and the lack of a market for the villagers labor power that is life-threatening. They can only sell their children, exposing the shallowness of the freedom too. As the narrator writes, they felt as if this act, done freely by themselves, no one had forced them, no one had threatened them, had not been performed willingly. In other words, the lack of freedom from external material constraints nullifies the freedom to do what you want, what you do not want to do, namely sell your children or watch your family starve to death. In the moment of her sale, Oryx is integrated into capitalism, so before she's part of this agrarian society and then by being uh, sold, she, she becomes a part of capitalism. But of course, she's not a producer, she's, she's part of cheap nature. She's a product to be bought and then to be used as a slave laborer. Perversely, however, her sale and her reduction to her exchange value is what, in her perspective, saves Oryx's life. For while she has to relinquish love and is forced into child prostitution, her value in the marketplace still works as a form of life insurance. Quote, love was undependable. It came and then it went, so it was good to have money value, because then at least those who wanted to make a profit from you would make sure you were fed enough and not damaged too much. Also, there were many who had neither love nor money value, and having one of these things was better than having nothing. 
This brings me to my final point, the novel's oscillation between a capitalist realist dystopianism and a post-apocalyptic utopianism. In spite of its insights into the interconnection of human labor and the appropriation of cheap nature in the web of life, the solution to our present capitalist predicament offered is within the limits of what um, Mark Fisher has called dystopian, uh, uh, sorry, uh, what Mark Fisher has called uh, capitalist realism. Frederick Jameson originally formulated the underlying premise as follows. Quote, it is easier, as someone once said, to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. And with that, the idea of a revolution overthrowing capitalism seems to have vanished. Despite aligning itself at first glance with capitalist realist fatalism, Oryx and Craig, in fact, contains an element of utopian dystopianism. If we can ignore the element of a narcissistic omnipotence fantasy underlying Craig's extermination of humanity and their replacement by his own breed of humanity 2.0, Craigers, there is, in fact, a utopian community of sorts in the Craigers. They are not only post-capitalist, but also post-libidinal, a drive Craig identifies as a source of human aggression and tendency to outdo others. They are vegan, they are post-religious, and so forth. They are, in other words, non-disruptive parts of the web of life. They are not like us and like the members of the Future Society Act, what depicts members of a capitalist society built on the Cartesian split between humans and nature. Furthermore, and perhaps somewhat vindicated Craig's humanicide, there is the strong suggestion that humanity would have ended its life on Earth regardless, with the difference of taking most non-human life with it as well. The primitive but peaceful Craigers thus establish a post-human uh, utopian society that stands in an irrevocable tension with their violent creation but whose naively utopian tribal society is at the same time accentuated by the dystopian pre-apocalyptic world that forms the other narrative strand. In this way, the novel paints a dual picture of a dystopian future and a post-apocalyptic utopia whose uneasy utopianism can only be achieved through a total disruption of capitalist logic in this sense, killing off all human beings, or almost all human beings. That the end of the novel introduces not only other human survivors, but also a budding religiosity among the Craigers, throws into question Craig's genetic containment of those traits he regarded as destructive, and makes the novel's utopian element even more ambiguous. But that is a matter for another presentation or for the discussion. Thank you very much for your attention.